Okay, so um, what we did is we collected a lot of, well, we have a lot of questions, some of which, well, no point to ask now, but because <laughs> we've collected them over the past, you know, several weeks, and of course a lot of them had to do with this season six happening and all that, so we won't ask about most of those because... Because it's not relevant they've already, Yeah, it's no longer relevant. Okay, um, so I guess the first question you want to ask, this comes from a, a listener named uh, Dan Zer. He wants to know how you got into voice acting. Oh wow! Yeah, I was uh, I was 15 years old, and uh, here in Overland Park, Kansas, and there, you know, it was back in the days when there, you know, we had no internet, we didn't have computers or computer games or any of that. We had three television stations in the whole country, um, and like most cities uh, in America back then and still today, uh, most of the commercials, the local spots that you hear uh, on radio or television are done by, you know, local disc jockeys. And they all sounded exactly the same. You know, it was like, you know, this Saturday, come down to the waterbed gallery, you know. And um, so uh, I, I knew I could do a better job at that and uh, than I was hearing on television. And I, But I had no idea. I, you know, I didn't know that people got paid for this so, oh, shit, I'm talking. it's my baby um i didn't know people got paid uh, to do this it just i just assumed it was something that you know the local radio station or tv station did for free and i started calling local advertisers you know i went to the yellow pages and you know found the waterbed gallery or the you know phone store or whatever and i you know i was 15 i had no tact at all and i was basically calling up saying you know, your commercial sucks and, and I could do better. <laughs> of course, they didn't receive that real well most of the time. And uh, uh, one day I called uh, the American Cancer Society because they had put a PSA on the air that sounded absolutely horrendous. It's, I, I, as I described it, I said it sounded like they stuck a microphone in front of the secretary's face and said, here, read this. And that's about what they did. Um, and an hour later, I got a call back from what was at the time the largest ad agency in Kansas City. And they thought I was an adult and that I was a professional voiceover guy. And um, they asked if I would be, you know, would I be nice enough to uh, donate my services for a uh, American Cancer Society spot they were doing like th that Thursday. And I said, yeah, sure. Well, I had to have my dad drive me down there. And of course they walk up to him and not me, because they assumed that that was the guy they were talking to. And my dad was like, no, that's that's who you were talking to. And uh, the poor guy was getting his butt chewed by his creative director because they had spent money on the studio and all this stuff. And uh, um, he said, you know, have you ever done this before? I'm like, no, but I, you know, I, I got to be better than what I've been hearing. And, uh, I, you know, I saw him through the glass at the recording studio. He was, you know, he was going, his creative director was going, and I just, I looked up and I said, do you want this in some kind of accent? Because I didn't know the term dialect. And uh, they're like, and the guy, the creative director was like, what? What do you mean accent? And I said, I don't know. I thought it might sound good like the, you know, the old man in the Pepperidge Farm commercials. And, you know, he hits the talk back button. He goes, oh, wait, you can talk like a 70-year-old New England man? I'm like, yeah, sure. He goes, well, let's hear that. And... Um, Oh, gosh, I still remember it. So every weekend, a couple dozen Kansas City families have a couple dozen garage sales. But on July 1st and 2nd, a thousand Kansas City families are going to have just one garage sale. anyway. And uh, I read it through, and it came in almost it was 29 seconds, which is perfect, uh, just coincidentally. And uh, I look up, and they're both going, because, you know, back then in Kansas City, nobody did anything like that. And... Um, Three days later, I got a call from the same ad agency, and they wanted to hire me to do five paid television commercials, and I got more and more and more. And so by the time that summer was done, I, I turned 16, and uh, I actually was able to buy a car, uh, a used car, a 1972 Ford Gran Torino. Um, so I realized this is this is a career. This is something you could do for a living. And uh, 
I did. And, you know, I went to, uh, I finished high school and went to college and got a degree in television and film. And by the time I got out of high school, I'd probably done 80 or 100 commercials. And by the time I got out of college, I'd done several hundred. So uh, that's how I got started. Wow, that's great. So the next question we have is um, has to do with this. Uh, it's from a uh, listener, Mike Schaefer, who wants to know who was your Yoda, so to speak, in the art of voice acting? Who was your mentor, your trainer when it came to voice acting? Oh, well, that's yeah, interesting. That's a good question. No one's ever asked me that before. I, I didn't really have one. Um, when it came to voice, but most voice were like commercials and uh, stuff like that. I really didn't have one. I just... You know, I'm, some people are really good at, at coming up with new voices, like Tom Kenny is SpongeBob, SpongeBob, and Billy West is, you know, uh, Ren and Stimpy and Futurama and all that. I'm I'm kind of just a mimic. I, I sort of take stuff I I grew up listening to, um, in the golden age of television reruns, and I I sort of recycle the stuff I heard. Um, so in a way, I guess you could say my my mentors were reruns of Hogan's Heroes and Star Trek. You know, duck, you know, I learned my Scottish accent from Scotty on Star Trek. You know, Doctor McCoy, you cannot go past what five or so blow. You know, and uh, and the funny part is, is I actually did Scotty and a couple other Star Trek characters for a game recently. So, but the um, uh, in the the only guy I could point to that I said was really sort of a mentor was in the area of uh, promos and and uh, movie trailers, and his, his name was Don LaFontaine, and he unfortunately passed away a few years ago, and he was a good friend, but uh, he was the guy. He He's the one that invented that whole inner world, no, you know, read, um, and... Uh, he, he he was nice enough to take me under his wing and give me some pointers, and uh, he's done that with a few voiceover guys. But uh, I, I learned a lot of what I I do from him. So, so so you basically you watch television and then you mimic what people say, or you watch yeah. you listen to things and you can mimic it. Yeah, oh, that's and I, really cool. You know, and I and I, you know what I didn't realize at the time was, of course, the people that were on those television shows that were made back in the fifties and sixties and and 70s and the early 70s, they were character actors, the, the likes of which you just don't see anymore because no one would believe it at this point. Um, you know, we've, we've evolved, uh, if not, not necessarily in a good way, but we've advanced uh, as, as viewers that, to the point where we won't accept uh, the kind of character actors that were normal back then. I mean, you know, Thurston Howell, you know, from Gilligan's Island, love it. Um, you know, ooh, ooh, you know, there's nobody really like that. So if they put that on a television show today, unless it's on like a, you know, the Disney Channel or Nickelodeon, no one's going to accept that as being a real human being. But back in the day, that was typical. I mean, uh, there was a a guy that was a regular on, on uh, I Love Lucy. And I mean, imagine back, imagine being a, a character actor and... The same show has you on five times in a season, and you're playing five different characters. But you sound the same, you look the same, and, and America accepted that back then. I mean, there was a guy named, uh, I can't remember his name, he was he was like, oh, no, Mrs. Ricardo, and he was the bank teller, and who oh, were the, he was the hotel manager, oh, come in. And he was the exact same person. Just in this episode, he was a bank teller. In that episode, he was the hotel manager. In that episode, he was a dentist. And and again, somehow the viewing audience said, oh, okay, that's fine. Well, that never happens today. If someone plays a character on a TV show, they're not gonna have the same guy back three episodes later playing a different character, because no one will buy it. And for the same reason, the extreme characters that they used to have on television were, were basically voiceover people that were on camera. They were cartoon characters, but on camera. So today, if some guy is going, oh, hello, Mrs. Ricardo, if he's on camera, you're going to be like, well, that's just weird. It's not believable. But if it's a cartoon voice, you can totally accept that. So I didn't realize it at the time, but what I was doing when I was mimicking uh, you know, uh, Scotty from Star Trek and and this guy from I Love Lucy and and an old, you know, you need an old cowboy, you know, it's old, old Western guys. I know what you're saying, dude. 
I was actually mimicking some of the best voiceover people in the industry. So when I got to the point where I was actually doing it, I would just, and they say, oh, well, we need a, a French chef. Well, I would pull, you know, something from my brain that I'd seen on a television show when I was seven. So I'm, as I say, I'm just kind of a, I'm a, I'm a good mimic. So I, I take things that, that I heard when I, when I was growing up and I just recycle them. So. so have you ever tried mimicking like Dick Van Dyke or anything like <laughs> well, that? There are some voices that are easy to mimic and some that are really hard. He's, he's one of those that's almost impossible because there's no, <laughs> there's no hook there. For instance, I get asked seriously at least once a month. I get asked if I can do uh, uh, Tom Hanks or something that sounds like Tom yeah. Hanks. And, and nobody can do Tom Hanks except his brother Jim, who actually does a lot of Tom's ADR work, because vocally they're identical. If you were just listening, you can't tell the difference between Jim and Tom. So I, I, I actually have Jim's manager and agent information on my computer, and I just say, just don't even try to find anybody, just call Jim. Because there's, no, you know, there's just some voices that we can't replicate. Tim Allen, there's, you know, a couple guys that try to do Tim Allen and it doesn't work. It just doesn't sound like him. Tanner, can I have that? Ah, that's really cool. Cause like, you know, I, I know a lot of these people, like, I guess with Dick Van Dyke, he, he's sort of iconic the way his voice is. And his, I guess his voice isn't type one you ever hear imitated is because no. he just, well, he, he, he talks really fast and he talks in a very distinct way. Well, and it's, it, it, he's again, Dick Van Dyke is exactly like Tom Hanks in that you either just naturally sound like him or you don't. And because again, there, there's nothing that you can grab onto as a voiceover person, as a mimic. There's, there's not a hook there. I mean, John Wayne, you know, there's tons of guys that have done John Wayne impersonations over the years, and some of them are not really very good impersonations, but they, they couple it with the mannerisms and the walk, and, and all of a sudden it's like, well, hello, pilgrim. And then it's like, oh, it's John Wayne. But if, you know, if, if, you, if you just, if there's not anything there vocally that's a hook that you can grab onto, then it's very hard to do that. That's, that reminds me of Seth MacFarlane's John Wayne imitation, where he just goes, hello, pilgrim. Yeah. <laughs> That's well, all he does. Seth, you know, Seth, is, Seth again, is a, you know, he's, he's a mutant uh, in, a, in a good way. Um, I, I kind of lump Seth in with, there's a few guys like him that come up with just marvelously good voices, and, and there's enough separation that, that they sound like different people. And that's, that's the tough part. I mean, there's, you know, it's not just that you can do 20 voices. They have to sound like 20 different things. And Seth is very good at that. I mean, there's, I mean, there are times when it doesn't work. I mean, his Ted sounded too much like Peter Griffin, but, <laughs> but in general, you know, he's, he's another guy that just, you know, they're like the Mel Blanks of our age. <laughs> okay. So I guess we're going to move uh, into, since we're a Star Wars podcast, we're going to move a little more into Clone Wars since of course you did voice the, you know, iconic, you know, Yoda. So how did you feel? Um, when you first started revoicing Yoda? Well, I'm going to move to a different room. Um, obviously, you know, Yoda is one of those iconic characters that, you know, comes along once in a generation. You know, if you, you just don't find, you know, a, a Yoda around every day and as an actor. But the thing that's weird about doing something like Yoda is because it was an existing character, and and it's something that was already so well established. You, your job as a voiceover guy is completely different. Normally, what you what you strive for as a voiceover guy is coming up with something new or and different. You know, putting your twist on on that French chef. But when you're picking up something that has been around and everybody has heard, your your job is not to come up with something new. It's to try to come as close to something that exists as you can. And I think that's a lot of why I got it, because I said, I'm a good mimic. And, um, you know, I saw Star Wars when I was in ninth grade, and I think I saw it 12 times that, that summer, and I don't know how many times since. So those things were in my head. Um, and I, you know, I really didn't think I was good enough to ever actually do, do that for real. It was just something I did for fun, you know, and, uh, when I was uh, in Los Angeles and I was starting to book things uh, regularly, I was getting hired to do things for Lucas Arts, 
which is the video game division. And they found out very quickly that I was able to do a whole bunch of characters from the Star Wars universe, um, you know, to varying degrees of ability. And so they, you know, they were having me replicate, uh, you know, but Peter Cushing, Grand Moff Tarkin, you, you preferred another target, military target, then name the system. Um, Akbar, you know, it's a trap, the forest moon of Endor, you know. So I was doing a lot of sound alike things. Um, and one day I, you know, was just goofing around and I was, I saw lines for Yoda and I was reading them in Yoda. And what I didn't know was that Frank Oz was actually off directing a movie. He's actually a very successful movie director. And, uh, you know, he just wasn't available to do stuff because, as I say, you know, once you're a director, a movie director, it's kind of hard to go back and be a voiceover guy for someone else, I'm sure. So, um, uh, turns out that they needed a Yoda and I didn't know and they recorded what I was goofing around with and uh, played it for George and he said, yeah, he's good, use him. So I've been Yoda since and that was, oh my God, 12 years ago, 15 maybe or more, I don't know. I do I do that. I, I, I'm sort of the backup C-3PO for a uh, uh, lot of things. I mean, if Anthony doesn't want to do something, then they, they have me do that too. And the same thing as I'm a good mimic. You know, so. Hello, I'm C-3PO, human cyborg relations. <laughs> okay, so this next question comes from um, my, my five-year-old nephew, Max, who uh, watches Clone Wars all the time. Mm -hmm. And he just wants to know... Um, how you get your voice to sound the way Yoda sounds like? Is there a particular way that you you morph your voice? You have to like mm. practice. You have to warm up. Do you have to like? How do you get Yoda to sound like Yoda? Uh, it's it again. I'm I'm not I'm not one of those guys that's good at creating new things. So um, with me, it's just I either can just do it or I can't. Um, there's a lot of voiceover guys that will practice and really you know contort themselves to come up with a voice. And it, that's just one that it was just there. Um, I, I don't, I don't warm up. I don't do anything in particular. Um, you know, I just, it's like I, I kind of liken it to being a, like a computer with a, you know, various programs or apps. Today, it's like you know, I turn on the Yoda app and it's there, or I turn on the Mr. Harriman app, or I turn on the you know French Chef app, and it's just there. So I, you know, I, I've never had a vocal coach, and I've, I've never taken lessons or done any of that. It's just, you know, some people are born with the ability to sing or draw or paint. And mine is just, um, I'm, I'm good at, at, at replicating some voices. And, uh, but yeah, I don't really do anything. It's just, obviously, if, you know, if I'm sick or something, then I have to just sort of work a little harder to try to get, you know, <clears throat> but basically there it is all the time. Yeah. So. <laughs> So have you ever had a time where you like mixed your apps together where you were trying to do Yoda and it's like the French chef came out and you're like, oh, I'm sorry, uh, sorry, sorry. That's only, yeah, a couple times. I mean, it's not very often, but there have been times usually like like when I'm sick or something, if I, you know, I'm down with the flu or something. I still work because I, if, as long as I sound okay, um, you know, because I, I work out of my house. Uh, so it's, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to come up with a valid reason why I can't do something. Um, so even if, uh, you know, I'm ill, um, as long as I sound good, I'll, you know, I'll still try to, you know, do whatever it is people need. And, um, and that's when it happens. It's, you know, so if I'm just sick and I'm just, you know, not all there, I'm on cough medicine or something kind of, kind of out of it. Um, yeah, that's happened a few times where I started drifting, you know, from something into something else. And, uh, but I usually, you know, I can tell within a few words, I'm like, wait a minute, that doesn't sound right. So. Hello. Oh, sorry. I had myself on mute. Oh, okay. <laughs> I hit the mute. Okay. So the the last question um my my nephew wants to know is since you've played Yoda for so long, um, have you ever been given any background information about his character or his personality that perhaps we didn't know as fans that you'd be able to share? I wish. Um I've been told by other people that have worked with uh, George for a long time that Yoda has been his favorite character for quite a while. He he, and he purposefully has kept Yoda mysterious. I mean, he, 
many people have asked George if if he'll you know come up with some backstory for Yoda, and he just won't do it. He just smiles and goes, well, I don't know. But uh, that was a, a choice he made. He wanted Yoda to be, uh, you know, an enigma and and not you know people because again, what he's he's the only uh, character that you see that's that's there are essentially no others of his species in the entire Star Wars universe. I mean, you, there's there's Yaddle, and which you see very briefly, and then in the Old Republic there was a. Uh, uh, Oh, what was the old republic? What was his name? There was another Yoda species in. Uh, I can't remember his. Name I can't either. remember either. But that, and I voiced, I voiced that one as well. And um, other than that, there aren't any more of him. And and uh, and again, that he did that on purpose because you know if if every time they walk into a bar, there's three Yoda, you know, species there, then it, it's obviously a more common thing. So, but he purposefully kept whatever it is, wherever he's from, and whatever his backstory is. Uh, I'm sure George has one. I'm sure it's in his head somewhere. But he, uh, like you said, he just kind of smiles and says, okay, next question. <laughs> so, <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to go to the Old Republic in just a minute, but I'm going to continue doing some Yoda questions first. Yes. Um, so let's see here. We already answered some of these. So... Uh, when it comes to when it comes to Yoda, a lot of us were really surprised in the season five finale that Yoda, well, I guess like most of the council, kind of became. They seem to be uh, judging Ahsoka before she, you know, without actually having all the facts and so on. So, did you find that strange that Yoda was somehow, you know, go, it seemed like turning against a Jedi that had only done good till that since then, or was Yoda pressured from other sides, or was Yoda actually? Not with Ahsoka in that in that finale. I don't know if you understand my question I, here, but like no, I don't. I understand completely because it's something we talked about. Um, uh, again, unfortunately, some of the resolution to your question was uh, worked into season six, which we basically finished. And uh, when, where, and how it will see the light of day, or even if it will see the light of day, I don't know. Um, but there are things that happen in season six that, uh, completely explain that. And, and, uh, you know, I can't, I, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not allowed to talk about season six unless they, uh, unless they decide to release it. But, um, yeah, it is an odd thing because that was just something we all, all of us, Ashley and Matt and I, we were was like, well, wait a minute, wouldn't they know that she's telling the truth? Certainly Yoda must sense uh, that what she's saying when she says I'm innocent, if, if nobody else, Yoda at least, would, would know that she's right. She's not telling a lie. And, uh, and so that is a, a, a sort of a, a bizarre you know, uh, problem that a lot of people have pointed out. I must say I've gotten a lot of people saying, wait a minute, that, that's not consistent, you know, that Yoda would not know this. And, and Anakin... You know, he he knows he knows her better than any other person in the universe, and so you know it, it, it seems on the face of it unreasonable that Anakin and Yoda and Plo Koon, you know, these people that were so close to her, would suddenly all just lose their force ability to sense truth from fiction. But and I say it's like I said, if, if season six kind of. If it comes out somehow, uh, then a lot of those questions will be taken care of. But you're right; okay. it's weird. <laughs> yeah, it was definitely weird. It's kind of we uh, we had a uh, Consetta Parker, the publicist for James Arnold Taylor, yeah. and so on, on, and we were joking with her that her clients' characters were the only ones defending Ahsoka because they had you know Obi Wan, they had uh, yeah. Padme, and even Plo Koon was in the middle. You know, at least not, not outright judging her right in that and it was like well so your, your clients were the nice ones and <laughs> <laughs> well yeah, that's, a, that's okay though james is a nice guy in real life so oh yes okay so the next question comes from um listener adam o'brien and what he says is uh dave filoni seems to keep the stories of each character close to his chest how much are you told about your characters before the start of each session does dave surprise you with directions of you know, does does Dave, does Dave constantly surprise you with the directions that he gives you in episodes that you weren't expecting, or? Well, 
Yes, he does more so with the other characters. Um, you know, because uh, th the story really is about Ahsoka and her relationship with, with Anakin. So most of the time, Dave is, is you know, sort of filling in the backstory and the, mo the motivation for what, what's happening. It's affecting those characters. It's, it's a, you know, Anakin, Ahsoka, uh, um, most certainly. Um, but Yoda is, is again, he's, a, he, he's, a, again, he's so well established in everyone's mind that there's really not a lot to, to do in terms of telling, you know, me what, what's, what I'm supposed to say. It's because Dave and I, again, we have a, Dave and I have an odd sort of, you know, symbiosis when we, uh, when we do this, because we know, because we're such Star Wars nerds, uh, we know if something's not right with, with the way Yoda s is saying something. It's very common for, for Dave and I to, we'll be going through a script and there'll be a line from Yoda. And before we even try to lay one down, we, we both are going, yeah, this one, that's not, that's not right. That's not the way Yoda would say it. And uh, so, um, we are pretty amazingly on the same page when it when it comes to uh, Yoda. Um, he'll still give me direction because he, you know, it's more just uh, proximity, meaning like you know, I'll I'll read it a certain way, and he'll say, no, the person you're, you know, you're talking to Mace Windu, and Mace is not five feet away from you; he's fifty feet away. So I'll have to change the projection, um, stuff like that. It's it's more of a technical uh, direction than what's behind Yoda and what he's saying. Again, I don't know if it'll see the light of day, but we, we did some, uh, there, there was a, a story arc in, in season six that was pretty incredible in terms of people seeing Yoda um, as they've never seen him. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm told that they are finishing that arc, so it will come up some someplace. But oh, it's, cool, I, you were asking about... You were asking about, you know, Yoda's backstory. Well, this is the only time ever uh, that George allowed uh, us to sort of pull the curtain aside and see some of what's going on inside Yoda's head and his background and stuff. So, and I, as I said, the last word I heard is that they are going to, they are going to try to finish that arc. Um, where it'll play, I, I have no idea. But uh, okay. There's one thing for sure. The Clone Wars definitely the first episode we saw was definitely a Yoda centric one. The one oh, where uh, I can't remember. It was the the one where he had to defeat the thousand ambush. battle droid one. It was called Ambush. Yeah. yeah. Ambush. Yeah. Uh, every, and that was a blast to start it off with. And no, it was because it was the most. It was the Yoda that was closest to you know episode five. It was you know it it was um, and again I I always laugh because some so many fans get mad at George about different things, but. Honest to God, he you know most of the time he makes the right decision, and uh, you know people sometimes don't give him credit for it until later. But it's like the uh, one of the things people criticized when the movie came out before the series was the opening thing where it was me going, you know, Empire at War as the planet rival falls under attack. Um, works beautifully on the television series. It's like. You open every episode with this little snippet of something that sets up the episode, explains what came before, and then it does all that in 20 seconds. And then, boom, you're into the series. So something that didn't seem to fit quite well in the big theaters played perfectly on television. And, and, uh, and of course, you know, people, people were criticizing the movie. That wasn't any of our idea. It wasn't George's idea to release a movie. That was It was Warner Brothers. They said, look, let's gang together a few episodes and turn it into a movie and release that first. And, and you know, one of the things George said to us is, you know, this it's unfortunate in a way that that was everyone's first glimpse of the Clone Wars because it was the first, the first uh, scripts that were written. It was the first animation that was done. It was the first performances we all gave. So, you know, our, we, we, got much better as time goes on. And uh, so it was unfortunate that the very first thing the fans saw was not nearly as good as the work we're doing now, or were, so.
And it's unfortunate that some fans judge the entire series based on that first movie sure. or like random episodes they saw. Like I know someone who first episode he ever saw was Bomb Bad Jedi, and he judges the entire five seasons on Bomb Bad Jedi. I was like, that's one episode. Yeah. You can't – they got better every single season well, in I, every way. And the thing that is, again, unfortunate, and it's, it's something that's – it's not just, you know, Star Wars fans. I, I assume that the hardcore Trekkies or Trekkers, um, you know, they're the same way <laughs> that, you know, they there's just some, some things that they like and don't like. And, uh, you know – there's a lot of a lot of Star Wars fans that just were really reluctant to give the series a, a second look uh, because of exactly what you said. They saw one particular episode, and because it had Jar Jar in it, they're like, "Oh well, forget this." Um, but you know, I, I it was it was nice to see that uh, the change in the fans because you know from the time I was uh, first put into the public. Uh, by Lucasfilm PR and stuff. It was actually the first Clone Wars uh, 2D, you know, animation that like the Gendy series, Gendy stuff, yeah. yeah, which was phenomenal. Yeah, um, but from the from the time I started, you know, meeting fans, which was in that era, uh, to most recently, it's really been amazing to watch the change. You know, they they kind of have gone from crossing their arms, going, I don't, I don't think I'm going to, to suddenly you know guys putting in 300 hours and building clone armor and stuff i mean it's 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 been very gratifying to see that uh the people that did give it a chance are just they love it you know so indeed so you're talking about you know early episodes and different episodes and so on so do you have a favorite episode of clone wars or an episode that you feel was most enlightening to you as a star wars fan well favorite episode would would be ambush um it was it was just so sort of vintage yoda uh that that uh that in terms of just my my point of view as a fan uh that that would be my favorite um in terms of uh favorite episodes uh that that would give you you know, some insight into something that we hadn't seen before would would again have to be the 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 uh, mysterious Yoda, Yoda arc uh, <laughs> season six, which was, uh, um, uh, like I said, it, as a as a fan, I was just eating it up because it was like, wow, this is you know some stuff we've been wanting to see since day one. Is you know that Yoda was there's a lot more to him and a lot more going on than anyone ever you know, saw. So, and as I say, they'll come out somewhere some, sometime. So. Well, let's hope so. So, um, is there a Star Wars character in the movies or that you've heard of before that you haven't been able to voice that you would love to be able to voice or add into oh. Clone Wars or some game, any character that, if so, what type of, what character would you really like to voice? Oh, that's easy. Darth Vader. I mean, it's, you know, that's the voiceover gig of the 20th century. I mean, it, it just, um, you know, for a Star Wars fan uh, who's also a voiceover guy, that's the thing. You know, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, I, you know, Yoda. It would have been Yoda, but I'm doing Yoda. So the thing I I really you know look at and go, wow, I wish I could do that. Would have to be Darth. And they're, the guy that they're using mostly now, I think, is Matt Sloan. He was the. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's. Uh, he's doing pretty much all the Vader now. He's he was the. Uh, the fellow that was uh, did the fan films, the Chad Vader. Um, I think he also did Force Unleashed. Yeah, as I recall. Yeah, too. no, he's. I'm. I'm pretty sure he's the most most used Vader now because he has. He that there's that elusive little something that makes Vader sound like Vader, and and, and obviously James Earl Jones. While well, part of it from a vocal point of view, just technically, it's uh, it's because he's black. And he he that and that I, uh, people think I'm joking, but there is a different sound. Okay. There's something about um, uh, a lot of uh, African American men that it it actually there's a sound there that's different. Um, why it is, I don't know. I, I don't know if it's a physical difference or what. But but um, there, you know, when I when I describe it to people, it's like my natural speaking voice 
and this may make no sense to you guys at all if you're not voiceover people, but my natural speaking voice is, comes from forward in my mouth. And in order to make it sound like an African-American, I've, I've got to take it and make, make it sound like it's coming from somewhere else back in the back. And if you do that right, there's just something that sounds like, you know, James Earl Jones. But there's there's like almost a Caribbean something going on with his voice, and uh, and part of it is because he he was a uh, uh, I don't know most people don't know this, but James Earl Jones had a horrible stuttering problem when he was younger, and so part of the reason he talks so precisely is that's his way of making sure he doesn't stutter. And so you, you take all those various weird elements and you put it together and it's Darth Vader. And no one's been able to really nail that. I think Matt's probably come closer than anyone. So um, what he does, I'm not sure, but it, but it's a, it's a voice that I'm, oh my gosh, I, we, I've worked on stuff for LucasArts for 20, over 20 years. Um, and from even back then in the day, they were trying to find somebody that could do a good Vader because James wouldn't do it. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I tried it. Uh, they probably went through 50 other people trying to find that sound. So that's that's the hardest one in the Star Wars universe to, to replicate, I think. And that's why it'd be the one I would like to do. So. <laughs> so now we're going to shift gears a little bit more to the LucasArts side because you've done – well, if the LucasArts project has come out in the past – while you've been in it so. pretty much I, I was told by uh, a couple of the people up there that i've been in essentially everything they've done for 20 years <laughs> so it's so close to it <laughs> so you know i play a lot of the older public and um you your voice is recognizable prominently in some of the characters in that game yes like uh the the mon Cal i believe one is the mon Cala, oh, no, yeah. mon calamari yeah. admiral yeah. narlock and so on and so, uh, with with the older public, we we know it's you know has the record for like the most scripted lines ever for any sort of project. Oh, no, it's ridiculous. The the there's more um, there's more uh, recorded dialogue in the old Republic. Uh, the MMO is that right? MMO. Yeah. Um, I was told by uh, Dara, the director up at LucasArts, he, that there is more recorded dialogue in, in that game than all of the other LucasArts games put together. It is some, <laughs> it is some staggering amount of, of, uh, of stuff that they've recorded. And the, well, the head writer, um, Hal Hood, he was telling us how the scripts for that game when it came out, you know, so not now, like when it came out was equal to 236 Empire Strikes Back. Yeah. And then now it's like 300 no, or so that, with all that stuff they've added. And... I can completely believe that. I mean, I, I've when when you do a video game, uh, it it typically takes if you have a a, a medium sized character, uh, you'll be in the booth for between two and four hours. I I have uh, uh, again a character that's not not even a medium-sized character, it's a small one. And I've probably spent 20 hours just doing dialogue for that one sort of cyborg MX. What is it, MX? MX yeah, MX something. Um, MX something, yeah. Uh, MX, no, M14X. Yes, very good. But yeah, I, I it just, I, I've never worked on anything that has the, the depth of, uh, of uh, just you know, amazingly good sound is that game. So with that game, did you work mainly with LucasArts side or the Bioware side? Who was doing the recording and directing? Uh, I did it, I did it, well, both. I did some both, but uh, most of it was with LucasArts directly. But, okay. Um, and so when you record with LucasArts, do you usually, do you do that from your home or do you have to actually yeah, go to no. the studio and record it there? I do everything from my home. The only time uh, I record um, outside of my home studio is if there's a, uh, a technical issue where they, where they, uh, there's some, some, some of the game people have a specific program that they want to use and I don't have that program and I don't know how to use that program. So, uh, like I've been doing a lot of stuff for, uh, for Sony as, uh, uh Gandalf 
so I usually record that at a different studio because they want they want to be able to lock the time code or something like that. Um, but uh, other than that, I pretty much do everything from here. I mean, if obviously if I'm recording, you know, if I'm uh, voicing the Oscars or something, uh, then they want you there physically there. Um, so I'll I'll fly out to L.A. for something like that. But on, oh yeah, and you did that last year. Uh, no, th well this year the Oscars this year was uh, oh Woman. Fox. Uh, and you did it the year before, as I recall. Yeah, I've done it four four years prior to that. Wow. If they if they use a guy, it's me. And if they use a, a woman, they've they've used a few different ones. So hopefully they'll keep asking me back. <laughs> it's always like I remember last year's Oscars is when I remembered you most, and because I was paying more attention, I was like, holy cow, it's Tom yeah. Kane. He's really busy. Oh yeah. Well, that's part of why I do everything from my own studio. Is um, it would just be physically impossible to to do the number of uh, sessions and auditions that I do in a, a typical day if you had to drive anywhere because um especially in los angeles just to go from anywhere to anywhere it takes a half an hour at least uh if you're going from burbank to santa monica it'll take you 45 minutes or an hour um so you know i average anywhere from three to seven paid sessions a day um and at least at least 10 or 15 auditions so, uh, it, like I said, it's just physically impossible to do all that in a normal work day. So, um, it, you know, it's a, it's a necessity to do uh, stuff from, from a central location because, you know, unless you can <laughs> – if they can come up with a teleporter, then, uh, then I'll do that. And they refer to you as the busiest guy in Hollywood, and we can definitely tell why. <laughs> well, I don't know if I'm the busiest, but I, I definitely work more than my fair share. So I'm grateful for that. <laughs> So just from a technical side, like what do you record with then at home? Do you have like – like I use Adobe Sound Booth or Audition here and oh, yeah. I use my microphone. But like what do you use What do you use to record? And I have uh, – the equipment I have in my rack is actually almost vintage at this point because it's so old. Um, uh, I, the microphone I use is a 416, a Sennheiser 416. Um, it used to be sort of the standard for all movie trailer guys. It just if you were a guy, you pretty much worked on a Sennheiser. There, there are some newer mics that have come out in the last five, six years that are uh, some. Some of us are trying those out, but I, I'm just sticking with what I have because it works. Um, I've got a office that I'm sitting in right now, and uh, then I've got a booth that's over there that's about ten by ten and it's completely soundproofed and. Um, and because I live in the Midwest now, uh, you know, we have to do soundproofing that's kind of above and beyond what, what would be typical because if there's a thunderstorm going on outside, it would ruin – I wouldn't be able to do something if it was in a typical studio. So it's a, it's basically a vault. Um, but yeah, the uh, – uh, you know, I, I don't have a lot of uh, – I don't really process my stuff much, so I really – don't have a lot in the in the chain as they call it it's just basically a microphone going into a uh, a very modest board that's made by a company called Mackie and uh, and I, the thing that I rely on though desperately is there's a device called a Telos Zephyr and it's it's the thing that allows me to hook up to other studios live um, and and uh, the quality sounds exactly as if I was in their booth so um, it's actually based on really old technology. They're, they're, they're coming up with newer versions of this thing that will work over the Internet, but that's not quite there yet. Um, it, they're still kind of buggy. But uh, the uh, folks at AT&T told me that within the next probably five years, they're going to phase the entire ISDN system out because it's basically technology from the 1970s and 80s. And... Uh, you know, there's nobody using it anymore except us voiceover people. So it's going to go away sometime soon. Okay, so we have a couple more questions. One of them is uh, a fan of yours who basically just gave us a whole ton of list of voices you do that they would like to hear. Okay. <laughs> um, and see, they, they want to hear your Morgan Freeman, your <laughs> Professor Utonium, your Boba Fett, and where is the – oh, I just scrolled down. And uh, monkey fist. Oh gosh. Okay. Well, Morgan Freeman is uh, would be um, the temperature is now seventy five below zero. 
and a number of the penguin chicks do not survive the night. And we discover that, yes, indeed, penguin tastes like chicken. Um, <laughs> I first met Andy Dufresne in the summer of 1932. But yeah, it's a... Uh, I probably get asked to, to do Morgan, oh my gosh, three or four times a week. And I say no. I mean, because it's, you know, it's, that's, this is somebody who's, he's still alive. He's still working and he does voiceover work. Um, so, you know, it's like, it's, I, I think of it as almost stealing, you know, it's like, that. it's, you know, I'm, so I have a problem with that. I mean, the, I, I do, I do stuff for Morgan's accounts. Uh, and, but that's kind of the, what I go by. It's like, if it's something that's actually his project and I'm just, you know, they like visa, uh, for, oh my gosh, it's five or six years now, I've done all of Morgan Freeman spots for visa for just so they have something that, that sounds pretty much like him and they can use it for editing and testing and, and focus grouping with audiences. And then they'll bring Morgan in to, to actually record the real thing. So if it's something like that, yeah, I have no problem doing that because it's him. And I, you know, I've actually gotten him a lot of jobs where someone said, well, can we, can you do this, a scratch of this, called a scratch track as Morgan, and then they'll go hire him, you know, to do it. Um, <laughs> And then you did Robot Chicken, of course, as well. Well, yeah, well, yeah. If it's a <laughs> that, that's comedy, though. That's different. Yeah, if it's a parody, <laughs> if it's a parody and it's obviously something that they're they're making fun of something else, that's different because it's not, I'm not trying to pass myself off as really Morgan Freeman. It's just they want something that sounds similar. So Morgan so. Freeman's that, and uh, what was your next one? What was the other voice? Uh, Professor Utonium. Oh, yes, Professor Utonium. Um, that Mojo Jojo was the worst lab assistant I ever had. Um, yeah, that that that's actually uh, again I you know I, I kind of mix and match things that I listened to growing up, and that's that voice is sort of half me and half uh, a guy named Gary Owens, who was uh, most notably he was the guy on the uh, there was a show in the 1960s called Laugh In, and they would always cut to him and he would hold his hand against his ear and the, and the page in front of him, and he go, the fickle finger of faith award goes to Burbank, California. And uh, so I, I, liked, I, I like blended him with me and came up with Professor Utonium. So uh, uh, I was also on that show, I was also him, the villain. It's like, oh, hello, Powerpuff Girls. Uh, and I was uh, also the talking dog, something like that. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, so what's the next one um well we had uh jeremy bullock on oh, a week yeah. or two ago and you did boba fett's voice in i can't remember which project but i know you've done a boba fett's voice oh, yeah. and so we just want to hear your boba fett well god that, that's been a long time it would be um, um um you know i don't want you to hurt him he's not worth a lot to me dead or something yeah i mean it's something like that the funny part is is they've they've gone back and replaced all of the original boba fett voiceover work with the more modern sound now which is you know uh, from new zealand so now when you you do it he, he sounds like this but uh at the time it was it was just sort of a gruff and i and i don't even know who did the original voice for boba fett i'm, I'm not sure who that was but uh um, I, it might have been Jeremy, but I'm not sure. I think I think Jeremy, I don't think Jeremy did the voice. I think it was suit. like Baker, Alan Baker, or something weird like that. I think so. Okay, um, this one they didn't have on their list, but he just noted that you've done Magneto and Professor X at the oh, same yeah. time. Because <laughs> you have the I see the poster back there of Wolverine and the X Men. Oh yeah. Right behind you. Yeah, no. And I, so you've done uh, you've done Magneto. You've done both sides of the coin for that. Yeah, one. that I've done I've I've done that uh, a few times. I, I do a lot of stuff as Gandalf. Um, you shall not. You shall not pass. You shall not pass. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. We've got to do the most we can with the time we have. But yeah, Patrick Stewart is another voice I've done a lot of over the years. It's like you know, the first I was doing stuff as Captain Picard on a Star Trek game, you know, and, you know, number one, engage. And, um, and then I did Professor Xavier for uh, one of the X-Men games. Um, and of course that was all sort of sounding like Patrick Stewart and uh, um, uh, Magneto I did for Wolverine and the X-Men. And I did, uh, I think a, a few games as Magneto and 
Um, like I said, as far as I know, I've done all the Gandalf stuff for years. But uh, yeah, I get a lot of British stuff. I, I, I book the uh, British things a lot. I, I actually used to do ADR for Anthony Hopkins uh, on a few projects where they, you know, needed a line for a movie trailer or something. It's like, hello, Clarice. It's Buffalo Bill. You want him, don't you? I can give him to you. But uh, he's a fun one. <laughs> okay, so we have three questions, one of which will be really easy. I have a, there's a fan, um, his name is Mac, and every single time we have a Clone Wars person on, he makes us ask this question. Okay. And so we're just going to let him, since we might have many, we won't have many more opportunities to ask it. And he is a big fan of Opo Rancis, the oh my gosh. tentacle Jedi Master with like the, the beard and so on. Yeah. He hasn't been in Clone Wars yet, and he wants to know if you know if there's ever been a talk or any discussion about having him in Clone Wars, because he's getting desperate now. Well, I, n not with me. Um, I mean, that's not the kind of thing they would discuss with me. Um, but I, I'm, I'm certain that it's come up in terms of, uh, you know, when, when Dave and the writers and George get together and sort of brainstorm, um, I mean, they, they've gone through the entire star Wars universe and said, you know, you know what are the characters we're going to use? Which ones we're not? And they they had uh, many long meetings where you know Dave and Carrie and the writers would sit and I don't think they ever you know came to fist fights, but they they would definitely uh, you know uh, argue for why we should have this bounty hunter versus this and what we should go uh, you know how 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 often or a sing will show up and and why. Um, and then, you know, they would, as needed, came up with, a, you know, new ones sometimes, like Cad Bane, which is, was a brilliantly good character. Um, so it just, you know, I, I suspect it probably came up. Uh, but for whatever reason, they didn't do anything with that character, mainly because it's, you know, there are only a certain number of episodes, and there's so many things they could choose from um, that they, they wanted to try to keep a nice balance between established existing characters and then new ones you know trying to expand the universe so. i guess on that note um have they ever discussed trying to have a conversation between yoda and uh qui-gon since you know they hint on that in episode three have they had that discussion before uh well yeah i mean there there's been uh, again so again some of this comes, comes <laughs> up in and season six um where where the whole concept of of uh, of Jedi being able to, you know, uh, materialize after they're dead um, is something that is only touched on in the Clone Wars and in the in the arc uh, that I, I keep referencing uh, in season six. <laughs> that that is one that is uh, much more fleshed out. Um, you see uh, more than ever, um, you know what, what, where that comes from, and the ability to do it, and how it's done, and all this stuff. There's, there's a whole more, there's a lot more explanation that that comes up, and you'll just have to wait. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess one last question from a fan, and then our wrap-up question we usually do. Um, this one's from a fan, Michelle, and she just wants to know essentially who your heroes are. Who do you look up to, um, either in the industry or like? Who do you respect? Since a lot of people respect you and see you as you know someone to look up to, especially the kids and so on. You know, you're a hoot at conventions, at Celebration Six, especially when you were reading that script that James wrote. As I feel you're but like, have you? Uh, who do you look up to? Well, there. You know, it's funny because people you know look at all the stuff I've done, and they assume just because I'm, you know, at at, at at a certain level of, of voiceover work, and I've done some high profile things that I, you know, that, that we don't still have our own heroes and you're, and we do. I mean, I, I, in voiceover world, I, um, you know, I'm just in awe of, of, uh, Billy West, Tom Kinney, uh, Jim Cummings, you know, uh, Rob Paulson. There's just, there's, there's a few guys that, that I look at and go, they're doing stuff I couldn't do. Uh, you know, I, I listened to some of the work Tom's been doing recently on uh, on uh, Adventure Time, for instance, 
and it's just terrific. I mean, some some of the the nuance and the the little tiny vocal details that he gives uh, the Ice King and and stuff is just brilliant. So yeah, I look at some some of these guys and I go, you know, what the first thing that you think of is is I like I said, I go, I I I wouldn't come up with that. I, I wouldn't have done that, which is why he's doing it. But uh, oh, I don't know. I, I there've been a few a few. Uh, you know, like like everybody, I've, I've had a few teachers that I, I look up to and I remember that, you know, s steered me in a, in a good way. And, uh, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, just, you know, in the, in the movie trailer end of things, Don LaFontaine was, was definitely the, the big, big guy that, uh, that, that gave me a lot of good advice. So. Okay, so one last question and then uh, a minor request, which should be really mm -hmm. easy. So the last question is this one that we give every single guest we have on the show an opportunity to be on the soapbox. This is to promote, of course, any work you're currently doing, some like people want to promote games oh, you're working sure. on, shows you're working on, or convention appearances, signing, stuff like that. So um, we'll give you the soapbox. Now if you want to promote, you can toot your own horn whenever you'd like to do. Uh, I do have a number. I've got like three, three or four uh conventions that I'm, I'm booked on over the next year. Um, uh, one in Kansas City that's, I think, next month. Uh, Planet Comic Con, it's called. And there'll be a number of Star Wars people there. Um, I think Jeremy's going to be there and Peter Mayhew and uh, um, uh, Jet Lucas is actually going to be there for the first time ever. Or just oh, wow. Jet Lucas is actually... Wow, he's going in public. He is. Uh, first time wow. First time that's ever happened. Uh um uh yeah so then that'll be i think i think d baker's coming to that one as well um the uh, uh the, probably the most recent project i've been working on that i'm i'm personally looking forward to seeing is the there's another smurfs movie coming out and they uh for whatever reason um i, I they liked what i did in this first smurfs movie which i was narrator smurf old typecasting and uh I only had a few lines, but for whatever reason, people really liked that. Um, so in the next movie, the new one, uh, there's a they expanded the part ten times bigger than it was before. So I'm actually uh, in this new movie a few times. So that'll be fun. I've been doing uh, I've, I've probably done three or four recording sessions to get all that stuff done. So, but that yeah, that, that, that thing, I'm not sure when that's coming out. I have to I'll have to find out. But uh, uh, yeah, I mean that's you know just every day is something different. I, I'm doing a McDonald's spot or a Walmart spot or scrubbing bubbles or something. So. Okay, that's like that's yeah. I've definitely heard you for scrubbing bubbles, and I think I've heard you for Walmart as well. I haven't caught you in McDonald's, but I don't usually pay attention to McDonald's ads because that makes me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? I, 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 in a way, I think that's a good thing. If I, if I if I if I do my job you you won't necessarily know it's me uh you'll just hear it and accept it for what it is i mean i i did something the other day where they wanted just sort of a british uh nature film documentary sort of like you know attenborough-ish and i i was really happy and proud of it because when i was listening to the playback on some of some of the takes i was going that really doesn't sound like me so that's a good thing awesome so I guess what the minor request I have at the end is, would you mind recording a bumper in one of your voices? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, tell me what you want to say. Um, I guess to use – actually, I'll let you choose which one you want to use because the ones I would think of would be like Yolaren or um, even Morgan Freeman would be hilarious. But uh, one, of, one of your voices, just, you know, something along the lines of, you know, this is yeah, – you can Tom. either do the character or this is Tom Kane on Bombad Radio. Okay. Um, just something simple like that. Hi, this is Tom Kane, and you're listening to Bombad Radio. Uh, let me see, Austin. Let me do a... <clears throat> yes, Tom Kane this is, the voice of Jedi Master Yoda. And listening to Bombad Radio, you are. <laughs> so Awesome. <laughs> Hello, this is Tom Kane, the voice of Professor Utonium, and you're listening to Bombad Radio. <laughs> hey. Thank you. 
And uh, well, we've taken an hour of your time. Thank you for answering our questions. Uh, the fans love it, and you're always a hoot at, at conventions. Well, they, so continue the good work. Well, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll try to keep going as long as they'll have me. <laughs> Even though you tower above every other person there. <laughs> well, you know, it is funny. People they they get so. Uh, uh, surprised you know they'll ask to take a picture with me and i'll stand up and i'm six and a half feet tall and you know the fact that i'm a human doesn't surprise them but that i'm a tall human and the voice of yoda that somehow makes everybody go you know well or they get a picture with james arnold taylor and then they're like tom kane you're next like oh you're a bit bigger yeah <laughs> well james is closer to normal than i am i think we're, we're kind of we kind of bracket the normal range but the, <laughs> it's it, it's fun and thank you for being You're on welcome. um i'll send this to you as soon as it's up so that you can hear it i'll of course edit out the interruptions oh no, yes thank you thank you and uh have a good day you sir too. see you